Good morning. Good morning. Um, for uh, everyone at St. Patrick's, if you hadn't heard the news, uh, Liz uh, gave birth uh, this morning, early in the mor wee hours of the morning, so they had to induce, um, and she was in labor for a very long time. They ended up having to do a cesarean, but she's fine, and the baby's fine, and uh, so everybody's healthy. They're just tired. Uh, but I spoke to Derek this morning, and so they're very happy and grateful to God. So please uh, keep them in your prayers uh, as well. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a, a great joy uh, for me in particular to have Father Ed here. Father Ed is a very dear friend. He's been an amazing uh, support uh, to me over the years and uh, really uh, an, a great encouragement uh, to me in my Christian faith and in all the work that we've done here. Um, and uh, Father Ed has been a priest for about 82 years. <laughs> <laughs> Serving faithfully in the Antiochian art. That, that was a joke, it was 62 years. Um, <laughs> serving faithfully in the Antiochian, actually in all seriousness, 42 years he's been serving as a priest in the Antiochian archdiocese uh, very faithfully and uh, we're all very close to Bishop Thomas here, who was just with us. Well, uh, Bishop Thomas was the best man at Father Ed and Matushka Anna's wedding. Um, so they're, they're also very, very close, which I don't really understand how that happened. But... <laughs> you know, Bishop Basil couldn't understand it either. Really? Yeah, when, he, when he found out that, uh, that he was going to be our best man, he, he blurted out, did you know anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm having this cognitive dissonance about, anyway, I'm just kidding. Uh, we love Bishop Thomas and Father Ed. And uh, Father Ed also, is, he's retired now, um, but I, I guess in as much as you retire as a priest, but he served as our Vicar General in the Western Rite for many years after Father Paul Schneerly retired. Um, and so... Anyway, because he's retired, he's not uh, pastoring a parish, and that made him uh, available to come That's to right. our retreat. So I uh, retired back up to his home uh, in what well, town? Williamsport. Williamsport. And that house is from like 18... Oh, 1860s or 1870s. 1860s. And you grew up in the house. I did. Oh. And he's <laughs> back. And so, anyway, it's... Yeah. Uh, I remember when it was going up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for coming, Father. And sure. oh, schedule, uh, just, just so you know what's happening. So Father's going to give his first presentation and uh, however long that takes, and then we're going to take a break and have our tea. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, you tell me when the break's supposed to happen. Katie, when is the break supposed to happen? 11.45. And what time is it now? 10.30. 10.30. So you have plenty of time, more than enough time, right? You have an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so we'll we'll have the first session, and then we'll have a tea, and and then we'll have the second session, um, and then so we we've been doing this retreat for many years, and we've been doing three sessions, and this year we decided to cut back to two because everybody was like by the third session people's eyes were glazing over mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're going to do less this more this year and I think that'll be good and then we'll get off a little bit early and we still have Vespers uh, for those of you who can get back for Vespers and Benediction at five o'clock this evening we do not have Mass tonight um, so we're going to all cram in uh, for Mass in the morning okay thank you good father I appreciate it. Okay.
I was asked to talk about prayer and uh, probably specifically uh, in the context of our homes and our families. <clears throat> and rather than jump straight there, I wanted to talk about prayer in general and uh, what we, uh, we might be uh, dealing with before we start talking about where we, w we, could, we could put it. Uh, in Dom Guéranger's The Liturgical Year, which he wrote kind of throughout the whole second half of the 19th century, in his general preface, he starts out by saying, prayer is man's richest boom. It is his light, his nourishment, and his very life, for it brings him into communication with God, who is light, nourishment, and life. Of ourselves, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's a Bible verse. We must needs, therefore, address ourselves to Jesus Christ and say to him as the apostles did, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he says, it is the, it is the church. Christ teaches us to pray through the gift of his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit lives in the church. So somehow, prayer always ends up being centered in the church if it isn't even uh, begun and ended with the church. And this is a, a standard Christian idea that uh, prayer and the church are two things that are, are tied together. And that uh, prayer is in its highest form, I suppose, and, and even, middle, it's the prayer of the church. And when, <clears throat> when we pray, we take up our place with the angels who are always praising God, and in doing that, we become, in fact, the church because that's what the church is. If it's the kingdom of heaven uh, now, the kingdom of heaven, you know, as God prepared it and as Christ promised it, <clears throat> uh, we access that uh, through different kinds of prayer. <clears throat> and this is supposed to be, for us as human beings, a, uh, a sublime experience that actually moves us into the world of the kingdom of heaven and outside of the world in which we dwell. It takes us outside of time and it takes us beyond, uh, in fact, the second coming. Uh, the Byzantines get all excited about uh, their liturgy, uh, <clears throat> claiming that, uh, and well, not just claiming, but they, they know that it's true, that, uh, that the liturgy happens, it always happens outside of time, and it happens on the other side of the second coming. Because in the Byzantine liturgy, there's specifically a phrase that actually says that, having remembered those things which have come to pass for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the second and glorious coming. <clears throat> and these are things that happen in the past when we're involved in liturgy. But it happens that just that phrase falls in the liturgy. Doesn't mean that only the liturgy happens in that time frame. And that's a mistake that a lot of Byzantines make. They think it's only the divine liturgy that happens on the other side of the second coming. But in fact, uh, prayer itself, when you become immersed in prayer, when you, whether it's the, the daily office, which for sure happens on the other side of the second coming, that the office does. There's no way around it. 
that, that, that those prayers are prayers of the kingdom of God, which is eternal and exists on the other side of the uh, second coming. Uh, and even our own private devotions very often uh, move us into the presence of God and that moves us, therefore, outside of this world and outside of this age. So prayer is for us uh, something really important and, and which has on our lives huge impact and import that is beyond what we can describe in words. Some of the fathers uh, tried to put some of that uh, into words. And uh, I'm going to quote two of the Eastern ones because they, uh, their words, I think, come closer to the experience. One of them is a non Chalcedonian, Johanna Abu Dawele. Uh, isn't even orthodox. And he said, anyone who would enjoy sweet experiences of Christ must set himself resolutely to learn the art of prayer. For prayer is a process of drawing near to God more effective and more demanding on the part of the worshiper than any other spiritual exercise. It is a spiritual achievement of the highest order. In prayer, the believer's thoughts actually come to intermingle with the very mind of God the Lord. The worshiper comes to take on his Lord's likeness. He enjoys his precious gifts and becomes the depository of his secret mysteries. At the altar of prayer, God unfolds his treasures to the gaze of the worshiper and gives him to share in their possession and enjoyment. He who truly prays becomes worthy to see the glory of the divine majesty, to gaze upon the ineffable glory of the eternal power, all of which puts him under a spell of speechless wonder and supreme ecstasy so breathtakingly brilliant as the, is the vision of light which breaks upon his wondering eyes. Such is the very life of the spiritually minded, it is their greatest joy. He said a lot of things there, and all of them are true. <clears throat> Another one of the monks, uh, this one from Mount Sinai, uh, when talking about uh, the, uh, the Transfiguration, the Feast of the Transfiguration, uh, went a little bit beyond it. And he said, he's talking about when uh, the disciples said to Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Let, let's build a couple shelters, one, one, one for uh, Elijah and one for Moses and, and one for you. And, and like Jesus is like, you know, what are you talking about? And then it was all over uh, before they could get any further than that. But they were, they felt Lord, like they said, it's good for us to be here. That, that was how they, after they got over their, their initial panic, they said, it's good for us to be here. And speaking on that, this monk uh, said, what is more beautiful than to be with Christ? What is more desirable than his divine glory? Nothing is sweeter than the light that illumines the entire order of men and angels. And that's the same light that this man talked about over here. Nothing is more beloved than the life in which we all live and move and have our being. Now he's, talking, he's quoting St. Paul, but he's talking about the life in Christ. There is nothing sweeter than the ever-living beauty, nothing more pleasant than eternal joy and blessedness, by which no word can suffice to explain or thought to comprehend its sublimity and infinity. For how indeed can one speak about what is essentially an inexpressible beauty. How can one measure and describe what is essentially indescribable? This is the supreme object of hope and revelry of desire, and it is the end and zenith 
of all the blessings and promises and gifts of God bestowed upon us supernaturally. It is the enjoyment of a Christ-like blessedness. It is the election of seeing in a pure vision the theophany of the Lord and the fulfillment of his revelation in a pouring out of his light in bright flashing rays. And uh, St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain uh, quoted that whole thing uh, verbatim in uh, one, his book on spiritual counsel when he talks about prayer. Uh, there are other fathers, uh, really exciting ones, like uh, Simeon, Simeon the New Theologian, uh, who uh, didn't have enough words to be able to describe all of this and wrote volumes of poetry trying to, trying to express uh, how this experience works. And uh, <clears throat> there were uh, church musicians who tried to express it. Uh, I'm thinking of like John Cougazelis on the Holy Mountain, who tried to express in music what he was experiencing in prayer, and he wasn't able to. Uh, <clears throat> this, this experience, uh, which is the experience of, of Christ through prayer, uh, actually ended up sparking a controversy in the church uh, at the time of uh, St. Gregory Palamas, uh, which was a time of some unrest in the church, east and west anyway. And uh, um, uh, a couple of monks from either Sicily or southern Italy, Calabria, uh, went wandering onto the holy mountain and uh, discovered what was going on over there and uh, they would have probably been there visiting the Benedictine monastery that was there, the, uh, Amalfian. the Amalfian one. <clears throat> and because uh, there was a, a lot of tourism even then, people went to the Holy Mountain to, to visit and, and to uh, enjoy the atmosphere and the company of the monks and, and the atmosphere of prayer. And these, these monks that went there were, were unfortunately uh, very highly and very poorly educated, and they understood philosophy a lot better than they understood uh, scripture, and they were, they were upset that the monks were claiming to experience the stuff that I just read to you, and, and none of this came off of the holy mountain, which is, I, I did that on purpose. <clears throat> to show the, the broadness of this vision. I mean, uh, St. Uh, Benedict himself experienced uh, all of this and, and sought to share it with his monks, but he didn't, he didn't describe it in the ways that, that, that some of these others did. Well, the monks, these, these, these two uh, Italian monks, Sicilian monks, <laughs> started... Uh, uh, making a, a worldwide hullabaloo about this and it ended up being actual councils called to discuss this and uh, the monks needed a, a spokesman and they asked Gregory Palamas to do it and he actually ended up imprisoned over the whole thing for a while uh, because the, the councils went back and forth and sometimes they said yes this is okay and they said no this is not alright and since Gregory was out in the middle trying to explain it all to people uh, he ended up imprisoned uh, in the, in, the, in the West, uh, the Northern European monks, uh, the uh, Carthusians, uh, were following what was going on, and it was the age when what they call the uh, scholastics was just arising in, in the West. And they, they wrote uh, really vicious things about the scholastics and said, no, 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 no. Uh, you don't understand that uh, uh, this isn't something that, that that you can do logically using philosophy. This is something of the spirit and the heart that God comes and he touches us and uh, it doesn't fall into those categories. And <clears throat> so in the end, when the church uh, started to sort this thing out and, 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 and try and prescribe what the church believes to try and end the controversy, 
they discover that it probably has something to do with the incarnation. That because Christ, uh, because God the Word, chose to become a human being in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he united in himself the uncreated nature of God, which is beyond our world and our, our ability to even apprehend or, or experience him in any way, he united himself with humanity, with human nature in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, truly and really. And, and you know from church history that that idea, the incarnation, caused problems in the church and caused us to have uh, too many church councils which had to say too many things to, to teach us that God uh, eternally living and existing and beyond us became a human being uh, in the person of Jesus Christ and that, that gives us access to the uncreated God through the person of Jesus Christ. So while it's philosophically completely impossible for things of such different nature as the uncreated God and created humanity to become one. It's, it's philosophically impossible, and that's all been explained to us by uh, uh, theologians like Nestorius and, uh, and, and his type. <clears throat> and then the church came back and uh, unexplained it for us so that we could we could go back to pray. And, and it's only possible in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's, uh, that's, that's incredibly important uh, for us as Christians. And we, we focus on that from time to time, the, 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 the idea of the incarnation. And, uh, you know, we, we venerate it in the creed and in the uh, last gospel every time you know, we do those things. We're venerating the, 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 the event of the incarnation and its fact because, because specifically it's only that that allows us to enter into the kingdom of heaven and experience the presence of God. That wasn't possible before the incarnation. That's why it doesn't, it's not possible in the prophets and in, in Moses they were able to experience God in, in specialized certain ways, but not directly and not uniting themselves into the presence of God the way we can because of the incarnation. So when we talk about prayer as Christians, it's a very different thing than prayer was for the Old Testament people. Because prayer for us, because it's in Christ, unites us with him and the presence of God. And that's why what wasn't the case in the Old Testament is always the case now. That prayer can take us into the kingdom of heaven and beyond the confines of this world and even space and time. Which, which the Byzantines like to talk about with liturgy I'm convinced, and the fathers are with me, that, that this is the experience of prayer. This is the experience of Christ. And we enjoy that because of the fact of the incarnation. You know, we, we, and each year when we get to Christmas, or when we get to the, uh, the Annunciation, and we, we, we look at the very mysteries of the incarnation, we, we always have to remember that, that it's not just an event in time that happens so that Jesus could come and then uh, you know, die on the cross for us. <clears throat> it, it has much broader uh, effects on us in many different ways. And all that we enjoy in the church, all of it is only possible because of the incarnation. So. That, that part has to be understood from the beginning.
or prayer, prayer is not going to take us anywhere. And prayer is not going to be able to change us or do anything uh, with us. And that was what, <clears throat> what God himself discovered uh, through the Old Testament sacrifice system. Uh, the whole purpose of the, the system of sacrifice in the Old Testament was so that uh, people could be transformed. So that people could be transformed into the image of God. And it didn't work. And it, it needed something else. And what it needed was the incarnation to make it possible. So, we who live in Christ, and Christ lives in us because of our baptism, we can approach God in his person. Uh, we can approach him directly. And we can approach him uh, intimately. If we think of the, of the Lord's Prayer, that we can actually call him Father, and that in doing that, we enter into that direct relationship with him. You know, it's not just something we say, but when we say it, we, it happens. Uh, it's like signing a, a, a legal document. Uh, once you sign it, uh, things aren't the same again. They've changed. So when we call God Father, and we accept him as our Father, then we place ourselves in his presence as his children. And that, again, has consequences. Uh, and with our, it creates a relationship. Uh, a relationship which was pre foretold to us by the prophets. They tried to explain that, that, that God deals with us as a father. And, but it couldn't, we couldn't find the reality of it, which we can now. So whenever we pray, wherever we pray, we take ourselves from where we are and place ourselves in the presence of God as his children and acknowledge him as our Father. So wherever we do this, if it's here, in, in, the, uh, in the sanctuary, if it's at home, uh, in our uh, prayer corner, if it's in our car while we're traveling, uh, or in our, our place of employment, wherever that may be, uh, or if it's in, at home, uh, we're going about our daily chores. <clears throat> as soon as we address God, as soon as we place ourselves in his presence, then we are with him in the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we're doing is with him in the kingdom of heaven. So the dividing lines between where we are and where he is no longer exists. That's kind of what was meant when the temple veil was torn uh, on the day of the crucifixion. And it was torn in half. There's no more a division between where God is and where we are. That, that all those divisions have disappeared and there's only one place and that one place is where God is. So <clears throat> when, we, when we say our, our prayers in the morning, we say our prayers in the evening, we say our prayers during the day, uh, we're in a sense not just acknowledging, but we are living out and experiencing that we now live our whole life in Christ in the kingdom of heaven and that he lives in us in, in the world in which we dwell. And that these two things have become the same thing, you see. Both of those things happen simultaneously and they become the same thing. So <clears throat> that was why I didn't want to just jump into saying, you know, prayer at home. I didn't pick that title, by the way. It was picked for me by uh, a subdeacon in, uh, where does he go to church? I forget. Uh, the, the guy that's in charge of the uh, department 
of missions for the Eastern region. Yeah. He, he, he was in charge of putting together this, this uh, pre-Lenten retreat that I did for them. And uh, he, he chose that title. And then I did what I did just now. We kind of <laughs> scrapped the idea of it. Because what, what, what could it mean you know, to take prayer into the home? Uh, you, take it, you take the kingdom of heaven with you everywhere where you pray. And everywhere you pray becomes the kingdom of heaven. Uh, where uh, exactly uh, where we, we live and we dwell and we have our being, as uh, Garanger quoted from St. Paul, that uh, those, those types of realities have lost, have lost some meaning as, as we proceed through this. Now, <clears throat> there are some prerequisites that come with prayer that have been revealed to us by God himself. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, we, we need to understand that prayer involves thanksgiving always. Uh, it's kind of implied in Psalm 50, and it, it, in Psalm 50 and verse 14, it says, offer unto God thanksgiving. Uh, and just shortly before then, uh, in that psalm, he was complaining about how bad people are and that, uh, that they, they tend to be awfully no good and that uh, they need to get out of that. And he had been talking earlier about Thanksgiving and he, and he goes from the Thanksgiving to how bad people are and then he, goes, then he says strangely that uh, unless we order ourselves aright, he will tear us to shreds and destroy us. And then he goes on to say, so offer unto God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And he finishes the psalm with that. Uh, and sometimes when I read it, it looks like, you know, fix the bad things in your life or you're going to get hurt. Or you can read it, if you're not doing thanksgiving, no matter how bad you are, you're going to get hurt. And it, it, I, I, don't, I can't get a finger on it. It comes, it comes and goes both ways, it kind of moves around. But if you look at what, what Jesus, how he, when the, the lepers come to him and he heals them and, and, and one comes back to say thank, thank, thank you, he said, where's the rest of them? Uh, weren't they all healed? And only, only one comes back to say thank you. And, and Jesus remarks on it. He doesn't remark on a lot of things like that. So if he remarks on something to pay attention to, this Thanksgiving thing is, is big. It, it's big through the Psalms, all of them. And, and you, it pops up here and there in the prophets. And uh, St. Paul talks about it uh, quite a bit. Uh, in, uh, you, can, you look in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, in chapter five, he, he goes on and on about it, where he says, rejoice uh, evermore, pray without ceasing, and when everything give thanks. And in that last verse, in everything give thanks, uh, St. John Chrysostom has a whole sermon on that uh, where he talks about all the things we should be giving thanks for. And he mentions such wonderful things as sickness and war and, and famine and death. That the, all these things we should be giving thanks for. And <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, St. John uh, liked to be, uh, he liked to say shocking things just to get Know, people's response, and, and he did uh, in his life uh, far, far too much than than he needed. Uh, he, he he alienated lots of people on every side, uh, even other saints. Uh, right to the end, he was uh, he was a remarkable person that way. He could he could you know even alienate the saints, and uh, so he he gets very excited by giving thanks to God uh, for all things in all places. And that, by the way, is his last words, is it not? As he lay dying in, uh, in exile, uh, somewhere up in Armenia, uh, he said uh, his, his last words were, uh, glory be to God for all things, and he passed away. Uh, and that, uh, one of the things that he did was he wrote, he wrote, or gathered, picked up, 24 little short prayers like that, uh, little short things. And he assigned one of them for each hour of the day, so that 
uh, as you go through the day, uh, at each time of the day, you could repeat one of these little tiny short sentences or phrases uh, over and over again to keep your mind on God and change them up as the day goes by to work out different themes, and that's one of them. So, but it's one of them for the middle of the night. So it's possible he died around that time when that was the thing he was saying for the whole hour, or it might have had something to do with, with what was going on at the moment as he was actually giving his, his soul into the hands of God uh, after being uh, uh, tortured and brutalized by the, the soldiers that didn't like him and had dragged him all the way off by foot to Armenia. Uh, you can go any, any different way you want with it, but uh, clearly it was something important to him that we give thanks and uh, that we should rejoice, as St. Paul says, and that we should pray without ceasing. And uh, all of that seems maybe a bit much. Uh, it's not really reasonable to give thanks for, for famine and war and, uh, and, and bad politicians and, and other things like that, and sickness. It, it's really hard to give thanks if, if you're experiencing uh, food poisoning or something along those lines, or bad flu. And uh, it's really hard to pray during those moments too, and let alone rejoice on top of all of that. And uh, so probably St. Paul was you know, just making it up or maybe he wasn't. And that's probably the way we have to look at it. That these things are difficult to get our mind around, but on the other hand, these are required and it's the way it has to be. Uh, and that's, that's probably exactly the way it needs to be. Uh, <clears throat> we need to, to look into how to make all those things work and how to pray without ceasing. Well, St. John Chrysostom's idea on how to make that work was to have little prayers to say all day long, but, you know, just, just so there's always some prayer uh, in your mouth uh, as, you, as you move through the day. And that, that'll work, of course. Uh, maybe. <clears throat> because when circumstances get uh, overwhelming, it's kind of hard to keep control of our mind to where we can put it where we want it, and things get out of, uh, get out of our control. And uh, it happens uh, more easily than we, we like to admit. But uh, as we get older, uh, more things happen, and uh, more often we find that we, we are losing control of our minds. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, sicknesses happen, and hospitalizations happen, and other things happen, and, uh, and we have to, to find a way through it. And so it's better to have patterns built up in our lives from when we're younger so that we can lean on these patterns, that we can lean on uh, habit to help carry us through. Uh, and that all the way back into the Old Testament, people began to work out patterns for that very reason, so that in those moments when we can't always control our mind, uh, our habits might control our mind. And these are good ones, not bad ones. And you know, we want to replace the bad ones with good ones and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they developed uh, set, sets of prayers. You know, King David says that seven times a day uh, he prays. That's Psalm 119. Uh, and the church has always understood that to be the, uh, the origin of the canonical hours, uh, which set little moments of prayer throughout the day in set patterns that, uh, that are entirely predictable and that each one follows in that form and that uh, we, can, we can enter into uh, at any moment during the day. And those, are, uh, those have with them, they're the prayer of the church. They, are, uh, they connect us with all of the church fathers who prayed in the same patterns and the church today with all the monastics who are praying for us and for the whole world 
and with our local parish. Uh, so the canonical hours, as they like to call them, uh, have everything to recommend themselves for us, uh, and, and literally and in every way. And I, I think that uh, I think that we should look at those as examples of ways in which we could uh, integrate prayer into our daily life, which will have the effect of integrating our daily life into our prayer. <clears throat> There's many other things, too, besides that. I mean, uh, that, that bag is full of prayer books, all kinds of little devotional books and, and things that, that people, and most of those prayers are pulled out of the, the other prayer life of the church. Uh, the basic skeleton of our prayer life probably needs to be the, uh, the hours of the church. <clears throat> uh, and probably for both, most of us in the world, we need to do them in the way they were intended and not the way they became customary uh, in the monastic life. Because the monasteries have a different way of life than we do in the world. Uh, those the hours hmm, of the you know the, the, the first or prime you know third hour tears and the fourth or the you know, then sext and known and and those with with uh, lauds and uh, vespers kind of standing out apart from them and then compline uh, sitting down at the end. Uh, <clears throat> They're, they're very short. They're very small. They all have the exact same pattern. And uh, except for the actual psalms themselves in the little chapter, uh, they're identical all the way across. So they make it easy for us to, to learn them uh, so that we can have them with us no matter what our situation is. So that we can have them uh, in our hearts. When we were kids in school, you know, many, many years ago, uh, if you're as old as I am, uh, we used to learn things they said by heart. I know kids don't learn things by heart anymore. It, it, uh, and they, the phrase doesn't mean anything to them, I found out talking to teens. But for older people, you say, if you learn it by heart, you know exactly what, what they're talking about. You're going to memorize it which is the term they like to use nowadays. But learn it by heart <clears throat> is, a, is a better phrase, especially when we're talking about these prayers, because that's where they end up. You learn them, and they're in your heart, not just in your mind. And, and that is more true than you can possibly imagine. Uh, we had a lady in my parish, my last parish, uh, <clears throat> She had been one of the founders of the church choir back in the 1940s when in our archdiocese there was a big move to found church choirs and the youth movement was the way the Metropolitan went about doing it. And uh, so people that were involved in SOYO in the, in the 1940s, they were basically being trained uh, to, to start church choirs and to church, start church Sunday schools because they were trying to rebuild things after the war. And choirs are one of those things that they wanted. And uh, one of these nice women who had founded our church choir back in the 1940s, when she was a young girl, a teenager, uh, she went on to get married and she went on to become a voice instructor, uh, she gave her whole life to music, and then uh, <clears throat> her husband died and, and she was retired and, and uh, people in the community noticed that she was wandering around the streets, not always seeming to know where she was. And that she would show up at the church door uh, during the week, wanting to know why, why church wasn't going on. And they'd have to, someone would have to find her and say, well, it isn't Sunday, dear, and uh, uh, we'll let's take you back home. So her, her family decided it would be better for her to bring her back to Massachusetts, where she'd originally lived. And uh, to keep her there. So they brought her home and uh, set her up in a little uh, 
assisted apartment, and she went back to singing in our choir. Uh, and she, she was pretty bad off uh, cognitively. She, she wasn't barely able to function. She ended up in a nursing home. But when she, when she was up in the choir, she was able to sing everything from heart that she'd sung all her life. And her, her mental abilities, her losing those, didn't take away from her ability to pray and to sing the stuff that she'd learned by heart, especially in the church. <clears throat> and I, I went down to visit my first parish. They were having some kind of, a, of an event, and they invited me down there. <clears throat> and I, I was happy to see one of, the, one of the ladies that was active when I was down there. And uh, the pastor said to me, oh, don't bother saying hello to her. She doesn't know herself from a bar of soap. And I thought, well, that's an unfortunate turn of phrase, especially for a woman that was my friend. So, you know, we said, okay. So we, we were at liturgy. And at the end of liturgy, he let, he let me greet the folks, you know, with the blessing cross, the way the Byzantines do. And uh, she came up and called me by name, asked after my wife and family. She knew who I was. I hadn't been there in 30 years. She knew who I was. She may not have known herself, but she knew who I was. She greeted my wife. We had a wonderful time at coffee hour. You wouldn't know that, that there was anything wrong with her. And her sister was there and she said, uh, she's having a good, good day today. She's really having a good time. She said she brings her to church every Sunday and she sings in the choir every Sunday because she knew it all by heart and she could do it. So learning the prayers by heart gives them to us and they can't be taken away from us by sickness or the condition of our mind or any kind of, of thing that upsets us, you know, that can, can turn our lives inside out. And so I would encourage you to have a look at, at those little hours, you know, the first, the third, the sixth, and the ninth, the compline, and learn them by heart. <clears throat> it, it would be a nice project for you uh, at some point to sit down and learn these little things by heart. Uh, I was introduced to this uh, idea a little, a little later than I wished I had. <clears throat> I was listening to a priest uh, talk about when he was a young boy, some miracles he saw St. George do back in Syria. And uh, when he was talking about one of them, he was, remember when he was a seminarian, and they were at one of the St. George Monastery in, uh, in Syria, Tel Kalach. And he said, we were up on the roof, top of the, of the, the dormitory, and uh, we were all together, we were praying compline. Uh, he said, it was dark, uh, there were, and it, uh, it was difficult to see, and, but we were praying compline, because they were doing it by heart. All the seminarians had memorized compline, and they were saying it by heart together uh, with their priest up on the rooftop when they happened to look over and uh, and, and witness uh, a miracle. And it was just an aside that he said, you know, we were praying Compline. It was just uh, kind of offhand, and, and he took it for granted that, that sure, uh, everybody prays Compline by heart, don't they? Uh, that was what was underneath of there, because he'd been doing it since he was uh, uh, a preteen when he first went over to uh, the Balaman and hadn't thought anything of it. It was just, just part of their life, that, that they knew it by heart. Uh, and they, they'd learned uh, many of the services by heart uh, as students, and they kept them all their lives. It was something that then they had, and it couldn't be taken away from them. If you read the stories of the, uh, the Russian new martyrs under the communist yoke, so many times the clergy are rounded up to be taken off and shot. And while they're in the vehicle on their way to being shot, uh, they very often read the service for the departure of the soul by heart. Uh, they don't have books. I mean, the, the executioners didn't give it. Now, here's books for all of you so you can prepare yourselves before we shoot you. No, they aren't interested in that. But the clergy had done it so often in their parishes 
prayed for the people that were dying, and they knew it by heart. So they did it for themselves. Uh, there's, a, there's a very powerful uh, recollection that this one uh, soldier wrote of Easter in Dachau concentration camp in 1945. It's right at the end of the war. And they, there was a lot of Russian soldiers interned in, in Dachau. They were using it also as a prisoner of war camp. But also in there were uh, a lot of uh, clergy who had been rounded up, uh, and, uh, especially from Greece, from Mount Athos, amazingly. And one of them is uh, St. Nikolai Velimirovich, the Serbian who died in, in Pennsylvania in the 50s, uh, he was part of that experience there. There were a lot of clergy. And so they, <clears throat> they were coming free right at Pascha time. Pascha was, was, uh, was late that year, it was falling at the end of, uh, of April, and liberation was happening during April. And the, uh, it was, actually it was in May, I guess, the Pascha was in May. And they were liberated right at the end of April, and they decided to have Paschal services. But they had no books. So they said, well, we'll do without them. And they sang the whole service without books in all the different languages, in Greek, in Church Slavonic, in Romanian, in whatever they had people there. They did the whole thing by heart because even that type of a situation wasn't able to take away from them what they had in their hearts. And that, that whole story is repeated in different ways in different concentration camps. Concentration camps during the Second World War, uh, concentration camps in the Soviet Gulag. You find clergy that are, are interred with, with faithful and they're leading them in prayer in the services of the church in concentration camp situations where everything has been taken away from them everything except what they had in their hearts. And those, they had it forever. And it can't be taken away from them. And that's, that's so important for us because, yeah, we're not going to end up in a concentration camp, hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> but we're likely to end up in a nursing home, which is worse, I think, <laughs> in, as far as I can tell, much worse. Uh, and you might not have your mind with you. You might not be able to read, but you might find that you have those things in your heart that you had for years and years and years, and they can take you to places that you can't go otherwise if you don't have books and you don't have the ability to, uh, to read and you don't have uh, the time or the place or whatever. And that's a reality for all of us. You know, when you're sick in the hospital, when uh, you have uh, machines operating all around you, when you have uh, IVs in you, uh, you aren't able to open up you know, prayer books and Bibles and, and read and do that kind of stuff. You have to have in your heart the ability uh, to pray so that you can turn that terrible place, that terrible situation into the kingdom of God and into the kingdom of heaven. And that, that's, what, that's the gift that we have through prayer that can happen for us no matter where we are. Whether we're in a, uh, in a, in a, in a kindergarten, in a daycare center, in, a, in our home, or you know the other extreme at the other end of our life. Uh, over there. So <clears throat> this gift of prayer, the ability to pray, uh, it starts off with those things uh, which are words and it eventually takes us beyond that. And I, I hopefully we'll get to some of that today uh, as we move through this. But we have to start with the words. Uh, the, the earliest monastics, uh, the first thing when they went to the monastery to learn how to be monks, they were taught the Psalter by heart. The whole thing. 
That was, that was what they did every day outside of the church services. The new, the new monks, the young monks, they sat together and an older monk led them without books in learning the Psalter by heart. And when they learned the Psalter by heart, then they were eligible to become monks. Uh, the canon law that prescribes that uh, our bishops have to be unmarried, you know, it's a late canon law, it's the Council in, Council in Trullo uh, makes this decision, and it's after the iconoclast problem, and they found that uh, married bishops were pretty much useless to protect the church because the government could threaten their wives and children. And the monks were able to protect the church because they had no wives and children, they couldn't be threatened. Uh, if they tried to torture them, they didn't care. And, and they were by, by the thousands. <clears throat> we have all those new martyrs and new confessors uh, under iconoclasm. Uh, the canon states, let the bishops be chosen from the, among the monks. Make sure they know the, the Psalter by heart. So they aren't nominally monks. They aren't just tonsured and let go. They are real monks. They know the Psalter by heart. Uh, it's, the canon isn't widely followed anymore. Uh, very rarely, in fact. But the idea that a monk is somebody who knows the Psalter by heart, because that was the first thing that they learned, the first thing that they did. And when they found themselves in bad situations, that's how they occupied themselves in prayer, they recited the Psalter by heart. Well, it, it happens, that's not by mistake, because that's the basis of all of our church prayers, is the Psalter. It, it, it makes up the bulk of, of the center of all of our services. And if you know the Psalter by heart, then you have, you have prayer in you, you have it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we, we could, uh, in our daily lives, go about and learn the Psalter by heart. Although some people have that kind of a gift, I suppose, and they can do that, but not everybody has that. But if we learn just little bits of the Psalter here and there, uh, we'll find that it, it's, it's powerful enough to do its job. And therefore, I recommend the parts of the Psalter that show up in the canonical uh, hours, uh, especially the, uh, the little ones, the little hours which are easy for people to, to, to stop and say. Uh, you know, when they get up in the morning, on their way to work, uh, during their coffee break, uh, at lunchtime, you know, on their way home from work, they can, they can enter into prayer uh, and bless their whole day, and they don't have to have a book in front of them. They can do it you know, spontaneously as the need or the opportunity arises. <clears throat> so, as we begin uh, the process of acquiring prayer, which is what uh, Abba the Wele said in his, you know, when we uh, uh, put ourselves to this, this task of, of learning how to pray, uh, to learn some prayers by heart is, is the way it starts, and and to learn those particular prayers which were intended specifically to bless our day, to bless the time of day. As we go through the day, uh, it puts us in instantly into the mind of the church. It puts us instantly into the mind of the fathers and we find ourselves exactly where the church wanted us to be in order to bring us into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so that's uh, that's how I would like to recommend that, that we start uh, this journey into prayer would be to, uh, to learn by heart the small hours and to, uh, to use them to sanctify our day as we go through it. Uh, does it take five minutes to say a, uh, a little hour? Seven, do you think seven? Okay, five to seven uh, minutes. And everybody has little breaks of five to seven minutes throughout the day. Everybody does. And so everybody can, can use this and, and make it do something for their day. And, and uh, 
<clears throat> I promise you, if you give it a chance, that it will transform your whole life. Just those little hours. I mean, if, if you want to throw in uh, lauds and vespers, well, you know, you, there, there, you, there aren't words to describe what this is going to do to your life uh, at all. But just the little hours alone are, will, will make a huge dent uh, in, in the way we live and the way we, we respond to God. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they, they've, been, they've been grouped. Uh, uh, third and sixth hour are usually done as a group together. Uh, and it's usually right before Mass, actually, because Mass was supposed to happen after the sixth hour. That was the way it was intended. Ninth hour is always clustered with Vespers, and sometimes Compline as well. So when they start coming into, into clumps like that, they know they're no longer scattered through the day, so they don't have the ability to... Uh, to, to come into the day with us and to transform the, our day as we go. Uh, it's, it's, it's more effective for us living in the world if we pray at nine o'clock in the morning and at noon and then again you know, in, in the afternoon than if we pray in the morning before we start and the afternoon before, after we end. By getting a couple little spots in the, in, throughout the day it has a chance to cast its its shadow over the whole day, which which I it, it will it will do if you give it the chance. I mean, I'm not saying that clustering them is necessarily bad, and everybody's life works differently. It it might be better uh, to say third and sixth together at lunchtime if there's absolutely no chance that we could do it during the day, then skip it. You know, I mean, I'm it. And that's, that's something that, that you have to look at and also reassess all the time. Your, your, pri your private prayer rule, how you space it out and what you do, changes depending on your situation. When you're at work or at school, when you're on vacation, weekends, each change in, in your situation changes how, how those things fit into your life and how, how you uh, constitute them, how it works. So you're, you're constantly asked to sit down and reassess how you've, how you've ordered your, 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 your daily prayer rule depending on your, your daily situation. And it, it, this is really necessary because if you don't, uh, as, as, as you move into different phases of your life or even different situations when you go visiting, when you have a vacation, uh, things can happen, you'll end up losing your prayer life. You don't get it back. Uh, you, you'll say, okay, well, I'm on vacation, you know, okay, it, it isn't working, so I'll just scrap it. And then when, when I get home, it'll all happen again. I promise you when you get home, it won't happen, unless you really struggle at it. Because uh, the enemy doesn't want us to pray. And he's going to fight against us. And the whole point of having it, things uh, regulated is so that uh, there's less opportunity for the evil one to affect what we do and how we, how, we or, how, how we are able to approach God. So you need to have a rule, and it needs to, to be uh, fixed, but it also needs to be very flexible, and you have to be able to change it when, when it needs to be changed. You have to, you have to be aware that, there, that it needs to be changed every time something changes in your daily in, in your life, in your situation. You know, if you have a wonderful prayer life set up, exactly how it's working, and then uh, you have your first child, uh, you're gonna have to rearrange your prayer life because that child is gonna rearrange your whole life and it isn't gonna work. And then you, you get things set up, you know, a, a certain way, and then, you know, you change jobs or you move to a different place uh, in the country and, and your whole life is, is, is unordered, you have to reorder it. And, and you, you, you shouldn't feel bad about that. It's something that happens. Our lives change. Our prayer lives have to change. Uh, 
how we, how we make it all work, what, how much of it there is, how little of it there is, and, and these sorts of things. And again, the reason I really recommend the, uh, the little hours is because they are so small, and if you've memorized them, you can take them with you everywhere you go, and you can fit them in to your life no matter where you are, no matter how unorganized things are for a moment, uh, they, they, you, can, you can find a way to fit them in and they'll, uh, they will keep you going until you can put your roots back down and, and, and set things up the way you need, they need to be to order your life properly. Uh, because those little hours aren't enough for a prayer life, I mean, seriously. Uh, <clears throat> When, when you know these, these church fathers that talked about prayer, they they weren't that. That's not enough. That's, that's, you can't. Uh, it has to be more than that. That that's just to get you through the day. There needs to be anchors on both ends that are much bigger than that, and 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 have much more meat to them. Uh, that's why you've got vespers over here and you've got matins over here, and that's not that much more because that only takes twelve minutes. <laughs> To read each of those, you know, those are there. There needs to be time that you spend with God, there, and and then you know, there's other things to fit into your day too. There's there's the rosary. You want to do that every day, uh, and and uh, there's there's other things too. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Rhyming Psalters, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's built into our English language more than other languages. Rhymes for us is uh, it's something, something very, very English. And when uh, uh, Pope Adrian, it's Adrian, right? He's the Englishman. Uh, he was at the age when things were just starting to get put into English. And, and he, he actually tried a rhyming version of, of the Lord's Prayer. And he was, he was excited about rhyming versions of things. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't last. Uh, but if it... If there's no way around it. <clears throat> uh, every, every attempt at giving a version for the Psalter has changed its meaning. It's done that. Uh, and that starts with the Septuagint. Uh, if the Septuagint is the start, uh, if you know the, uh, the the Targums, which translated the Psalter into Aramaic, maybe were more successful because the language are, are so close and cognate. But if you've ever compared the Septuagint Psalter to the Hebrew Psalter, uh, the first thing you discover is that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. The Greek doesn't make any sense in whole, whole, whole spots. And sometimes you don't even know you got the same song. It's that different. Uh, and yet, <clears throat> the uh, Greek-speaking world uh, took the Septuagint Psalter as its own, and uh, the Greek church took the Septuagint Psalter as its own and considers and has found in it uh, to be a source of, uh, of inspiration and to be full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, other, other groups, you know, have done the same thing with other Psalters. Uh, somebody tried to convince me that the Antiochene Church, uh, the, the Septuagint is our Psalter, and that's not true. Because up until the, 17, the middle of the 1700s, our patriarchate was still praying in Aramaic and was still using the, the uh, Aramaic uh, versions uh, of the scriptures, not even one of them, there's multiple ones. And uh, there's, there's a Palestinian Aramaic version of the, of the, of the Psalter and there's the, uh, the more Eastern Syriac version of the Psalter. Uh, that was the, and that's the one that became standard for the, the patriarchate was the Peshito, the, 
the more Eastern uh, Syriac version. They, uh, they're all very different. Uh, the, the old Latin version uh, was different than Jerome's, and the Western church struggled over that uh, for quite a while, over which one they were going to use in the, in the, in the, in the, the hours. Which one are we going to use in the Psalter, uh, in the breviary, uh, Jerome's or the newer one? And uh, eventually they went with the newer one, but they kept all the, uh, the little uh, hymnic uh, sections in there, the, uh, the antiphons from the old Latin version, which is why they don't always match up in the psalm that follows, because they're from a different version, and, and, and they're, they're very different. Uh, Changing Psalter versions is traumatic uh, and, and shouldn't be done. <laughs> Whichever one you've nearly got memorized, that's the one you want to hang on to. <laughs> because changing that is not going to be useful for your spiritual life. It just isn't, I mean, it isn't going to go anywhere. There's no, and there's no reason to do it. Now, if you haven't got one, and you need to find one off the bat, uh, Yes, sir. Before you say what you're about, <laughs> we have it. Well, that's why I was going to say you're probably going to want to stick with the Coverdale. Yeah, because that's, that is what we pray. Yeah. And we pray it every day. So. Yeah. If you, if you were to memorize a different version, then, then when you come to church or when you do the hours, you know, as they're set up, you're going to be, if you're doing them on your own, you have to keep uh, substituting the other Psalter. And I, 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 I grew up with the King James, the authorized one. And it's wildly different. And I went so far as to, to mark up uh, a King James Psalter so that I can, I can read the hours <laughs> and plug in the King James Psalms. Because <laughs> this is so distracting to me. I can't even tell you how distracting that is. Uh, it, it's very difficult. But since that's the milieu in which you, you are uh, already, uh, that's the one that you want to grab. Uh, you need to go with the Coverdale Psalms because that's the one you're going to be praying in church. Uh, and, and it's really difficult to do otherwise. I know, for, I, I will guarantee you, I promise you, how difficult it is to plug the other one in all the way through. Uh, at seminary, they used the Revised Standard Version. And I which was close to the one I was used to, but not, not enough. And you still, you, you fall and you stumble and, 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 you, and then the, the, the things you have memorized, what happens is you start ending up with composite versions in your mind that aren't this or that. There's, some, there's something else. Uh, and I found out that a lot of clergy who had to memorize Psalm 50 it doesn't match any particular version, the one that they say there are, because they've, they've pulled it from different versions, and, and, and I'm one of those, too. Uh, <clears throat> you, you don't want to put yourself in that spot. So just go ahead and memorize the It's going to be the easiest thing to do. One year all the time, anyway, it's probably the one you have to memorize. How long have you been in the church? I've been in, I grew up in the East, so I've had <laughs> more of the That's part of why I was asking this, by the way. Where, where is the the which is the Which you the uh, I started with the OCA and then the OCA. So, so the end of the music is all the center. Yeah. From the, the monastery. Have uh, you got to do an It's all the same. No, okay. that, that's not making a difference. Whatever you've already got, don't you? Uh, if you haven't got something, don't cover it. If you've already got the song, It's a cover to insult. Oh, you're just you're just marking it up liturgically. No, it's just it's just all and it's going to have it's got all kinds of wonderful things. 
Okay. All right. But that's that's a. Oh please. <laughs> the the Marxist Coverdale Salter. Uh, so you're so you're the Trojan horse, are you? <laughs> I I didn't think it of you. Shame on you. Who who else has a question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, all this is where we have to go. Uh, <clears throat> this is the monastic diurnal. It's what it looks like, the latest edition, as far as I know. This is, this is what it, it looks like. Uh, it, comes, it comes in, uh, in two colors inside. That's supposed to help you, help you make it easy uh, to figure out what's going on. It has... Uh, a whole section in the beginning of how it works and how the thing operates. <clears throat> uh, when I suggested the little, the little hours, uh, there was a reason for that. <laughs> because they, they don't change much, except for Monday, oh, Sunday and Monday, let's say that, except for Sunday and Monday. Uh, they're, the, they're, they're, the order is identical all the way through the week. Uh, that's why it says through the week it tears. Through the week it sags. Uh, it means Tuesday through Saturday, they're, ident they're the same. Uh, <clears throat> on Monday the Psalms differ. Well, Sunday too. Sunday and Monday, the Psalms are different. But the rest of the week, they're, they're just the same. They're exactly the same. And they're very short. And there's nothing, there's no rubric. There's, 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 no, there's nothing to have to learn that could tangle around any axle. Uh, you would just read them as they are and, uh, and let them do their thing to you. At the end where it says, uh, insert the collect for the day, uh, <clears throat> Pick a collect and stick with it all day. <laughs> At first, you know, uh, that'll be that's that's definitely on the couch. Uh, <clears throat> uh, starting to uh, sit up a little bit is when you had to find out which is the collect for the day, <laughs> and and that isn't as hard as you can as, as you, you might imagine. Uh, it's it's laid out for you, but the little hours are easy. And, and you, can, you can get them extracted from here uh, just by themselves, uh, perhaps. Uh, I'm sure your, your spiritual father will be glad to, to do that for you, give you just the little hours uh, in, a, in a form that they could be done uh, without, without taxing yourself in any way. Uh, <clears throat> and they are, they're that easy, which is why I recommended them. Uh, and I, I really more than I recommend them be learned by heart so they can be, be had forever. Uh, you're not going to memorize uh, Vespers by heart because the Psalms uh, change every day and, and the, the prayers change and, and there's too much changeable in them. You can memorize the, the skeleton but you're not going to memorize those. You, all, you always have to have a book for those uh, unless your mind is a lot stronger than uh, most people's. Uh, compline you can memorize. Compline, very easy. Compline has no changeable parts to it at all. But just, just read it. There it is. Uh, the, 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 the monks 
felt so distressed that Compline didn't change that they changed the melody for the hymn, <laughs> for the seasons, <laughs> just so something would change in Compline. But and that's all. <laughs> that's it. Just the melody of the hymn. And I don't know anybody that actually does that in, in practice. Uh, yeah, that's that's where that's where it starts with the little hours and the rosary. Uh, right there. <clears throat> you, you don't even have to sit up on the couch to do those. That's the easiest ones, and that's that's where it needs to start. Uh, <clears throat> I understand that eventually coming, although not here yet, is uh, uh, lauds and vespers in a in an easy to read format without you having to look up anything. Uh, Lods and, and, and Vespers for Dummies. Uh, <clears throat> and there, and it, that's being worked on, on on both ends of the country at the same time, I gather. Uh, Father John's focus has been on the weekdays right now. He really wants to get the weekday ones done. And you guys are working on the Sunday and, and holidays. Uh, Clearly there's a need, a pastoral need for this because the, the only two parishes in the archdiocese that use the, the monastic office are both working on a, a, an, easy, an easy read version. Uh, so th there's no doubt this, this, is, this is a pastoral necessity and I'm glad that it's being done. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled in fact that when I think of the possibilities uh, of where that can go. But yes, and we'll, we'll talk about where you can go from there, but so far that's as far as I've gotten, and I promise you that that is the easy way. It, it, it is, uh, the little hours in the rosary have got you, and you're, you're off safe, and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't get lost. Uh, any other questions? I think we have, do we have time? No, we don't. It's 11.50. Because I was I told I was done at 11.45? Okay, I've run over it by five minutes. I apologize. Thank you, Father.